Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gamers Edicom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with Intel, specifically news and benchmarks concerning its Gen 11 graphics card architecture. Gen 11 is going to be very important for the company because not only will it form the basis of the next generation CPU's iGPU, but perhaps more importantly for us gamers anyway, it will also also be the basis of the discrete GPUs which the company are aiming to launch in the year 2020, currently known as Intel XE. You might recall that a couple of days ago I put out a video concerning Intel's Odyssey, which is where the company are currently recruiting folks who are gamers and content creators and so on to provide them insight, that is Intel insight, into what they want out of GPUs. I put out a video regarding that, so I'll link it in the video description if you want more information. But it's not the only time, of course, Intel have asked for feedback. They've recently also hosted an AMA, which pretty much went onto the same lines, that they were looking for uh, information from gamers of what they wanted from a GPU. However, now we have some benchmarks which have leaked for the Gen 11 graphics and I must say, oh just to clarify this is for the iGPU variant not the discrete GPU, but I have to say that if this scales up to discrete GPU uh, I would not be surprised if the performance for the GPU is extremely impressive. What we have here is the Iris Plus Graphics 940 with extremely impressive performance, easily beating out that older generation of GPUs from Intel, but perhaps considerably more impressive giving the Vega integrated GPUs a sound thrashing as well. So we're going to go into a couple of benchmarks which have been compiled by a Reddit user. The Reddit user in question is known as Dylan622P. So credit to him for putting these slides together. But what we have here is a variety of GFX benches which uh, compare the performance of the new Intel graphics chip, uh, the 940, the GT2, against a older Gen 620 graphics, and we'll get into the Vega stuff in just a moment, I promise. But uh, you can see the numbers yourself. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but tessellation performance alone is just massively improved. Well, actually all of the numbers are just greatly improved. We're looking at uh, between 50 and 120%, or even actually 130% improvement uh, from one generation of Intel uh, GPU to the other. And if you think that AMD are going to fare any better at all with the Vega graphics, it's, well, no. <laughs> uh, Vega as well get absolutely destroyed by the new uh, 940 graphics, which is once again generation 11. The performance advantage is 63% faster on average overall, but tessellation performance is a huge improvement over Vega with over a 200% increase in performance. There's only one SKU that has been benchmarked thus far and it's running at 1.3 gigahertz. We don't know a super large amount about the architecture yet, only the very basics. We know that it has twice the FP16 performance rate compared to the older generation. Uh, the new pipeline is known as the 3D pipeline, which consists of 64 execution units, and this is coupled with a free megabytes of level three cache. And also, of course, Intel have pledged support for technologies such as Adaptive Sync, which is probably one of the reasons we've seen NVIDIA uh, recently support Adaptive Sync with its G-Sync technology, because obviously they don't want to be the odd dark out. So it, it makes sense for NVIDIA to do the positive PR, PR thing now, because obviously if they waited until 2020, when Intel released the discrete GPUs, and then they reluctantly supported FreeSync with the you know, GeForce RTX 30. I don't know what will be out by then, but let's just call it the 20 series for consistency's sake. I think most people would probably just say, oh, you're only doing that because now you have two competitors which do, so it's better for them to get the positive PR. Either way, in my personal opinion, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Intel do in the discrete marketplace. I know that Intel don't necessarily have the best reputation, uh, particularly in the late 90s and even up until like the 
you know 2010 ish they did some really shady stuff in fact they still do some kind of shady stuff uh, when it comes to competition and stifling competition and we all know the story for that and there have been videos uh, and countless retellings of the story and i'd encourage you to check them out if you don't know that history but i also do want a lot of competition in the marketplace because otherwise we see stagnation and as much as i am extremely extremely excited for example about the rise in free fails and service processors matisse i also don't want intel to not have a viable competitor because otherwise it might mean that amd are a little more uh, gung-ho with the pricing after all if we see intel for example cut the price as much as possible for the ninth generation coffee lake we might see amd reduce the price a little more for its ryzen 3000 series and the same could be said of course for graphics nvidia have been a little complacent with uh, geforce uh, of late i mean look at pascal it's hard to believe that well it's not going to be too long until it's three years old uh, since the introduction of like the gtx 1080 and turn 70. And finally, late last year, we got the Touring series of cards. And yes, they are impressive. They certainly do have some improvements in uh, mixed precision performance. Uh, also, of course, the Tensor Cores are great if you're doing professional workflow and blah, 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 blah. But it's fair to say that DLSS, along with ray tracing, has not had the day one support that we'd expected. And actually, a little bit of a funny story for you. I actually had a code for Metro Exodus, basically done all of the testing, and then NVIDIA just released a new update, as well as uh, 4A Games, which improves the aesthetics, apparently. I've not tested it uh, super in-depth yet of DLSS. So I do feel that that technology has continued to evolve over time. But either way, it's good news to me that Intel are going to be extremely uh, aggressive with its graphics technology. And that's only going to benefit us as customers. And once again, I'd encourage you to check out uh, my other video, or you can just write in the description, oh, sorry, in the comments of this video, what you would actually like uh, Intel to focus on with its new graphics, like what type of price point, what type of performance, what type of feature set, and just generally what you would expect from the company to jump ship. And that, to be honest, is going to be the thing. Intel have a good history when it comes to graphics in that, you know, it's not like they've never produced a graphics architecture before. We all know that they've got the iGPUs and those work and that they've got a large install base there. And it's not like their graphics team are uh, untalented and obviously they've got folks like Raja Kodori and Chris Hook so and they've been extremely aggressive with their purchases but all of that does not equate to a successful product and it's also going to be convincing us convincing reviewers convincing the end users to say hey you know what I want to plonk down 200 300 500 a thousand US dollars in some instances for a graphics card and that to be honest is going to be the major hurdle they need to overcome so once again I want to hear your thoughts on this what would they need to do to convince you to plonk down the money regardless of the uh, regardless of the architecture and performance. Well, it makes sense to us to segue to Apple and Intel, who have had a relationship for a number of years now. But there has been rumors bubbling under the surface for some time that Apple do not want to continue its relationship, its best buddies relationship with Intel, and instead develop its own custom chips based upon ARM. And we expected this to happen eventually, most likely, but there is a report that's floating around right now that's on the Axios website that according to both Apple and Intel insiders, they expect uh, products from Apple Mac systems in included to start to ship next year, so 2020, which will indeed have the ARM-based processor. More, more about their plans at WWDC in June of 2019, or they might decide to just keep things a secret as long as possible. It does mean, though, we will see an even tighter grip uh, from Apple over the hardware which is inside the Mac uh, systems. And I will be interested to see how uh, Apple deal with uh, backwards compatibility with uh, applications. Obviously, you can certainly run uh, emulators, which is actually something we're going to be discussing in just a moment regarding emulators for the PlayStation 5, uh, to emulate the x86 architecture with an ARM-based processor. But... I will be interested to see what type of performance you're going to, uh, what type of performance impact you're going to have with legacy applications. And I suspect, obviously, that uh, 
Apple will update all of the operating system code for uh, for the Macintosh, but it will be very curious. And while we're on the subject of ARM at x86, let's also quickly touch on another thing that's floating around the internets right now, and that is from Linus Torvalds, who of course is heralded as one of the founding fathers of the Linux-based operating system. Essentially what he is saying is that, well, he would much rather pay the extra monies to go with an x86 architecture rather than some uh, ARM-based processor. He, in to paraphrase him, he said that we've already, you know, fought this war and uh, with RISC versus CISC, and basically x86 has won. In a forum post, he said, and I quote, some people think that the cloud means instruction set doesn't matter. Deploy at home, deploy in the cloud, that's a uh, sweary word. If you develop on x86 and you're going to want to deploy on x86 because you're able to run what you test at home, and by home, I don't mean literally in your home, but in your work environment. He also went on to say that cross-development is mainly done for platforms that are so weak as to make it pointless to develop on them. Nobody does native development on the embedded space, but whenever the target is powerful enough to support native development, there's a huge pressure on them to do it that way because cross-development model is so painful. Arm, unsurprisingly, has weighed in on this and have responded thusly. We appreciate Mr. Torvald's opinion and agree that end-to-end -end development platforms is essential, which is why we're taking the important step of announcing the Neoverse N1 System Development Platform, SDP. Geez, that just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? This week, and this was told to a spokesper- this is what a spokesperson uh, told the register via email. Torvald did help hedge his bets and said that, I will hold judgment until we actually have widely available hardware that people can actually use and develop for. I've just seen too many promises and released hardware, in quotation marks, that never went anywhere and nobody really reasonably, that never was really reasonably available. But hey, maybe they'll surprise me. A short while ago, we covered a topic that the PlayStation 5 would almost certainly feature backwards compatibility, and it would do so via spoofing the CPU ID, along with other tricks, of course, of older PlayStation consoles. The pattern was actually filed by several folks over at Cer uh, uh, Sony, <laughs> including Mark Cerny, who is the lead architect of the PlayStation 4 system. But to add fuel to the fire, there is yet another pattern that has been discovered concerning backwards compatibility. And this time, it mimics the behavior of an older bus structure of a PlayStation console. So what does this mean? Well, almost certainly, you guessed it, the PlayStation 5 will support backwards compatibility for older consoles. And it's going to be interesting to me how all of this works. Like, if it's done via disk, it would be incredible. Although, it does raise questions like what would happen to the used game market and the cost of, let's say, PlayStation 2 games or PS3 games, assuming the system would be uh, capable of running PS3 games. After all, none of this is confirmed yet. I wouldn't be surprised, though, after all, there is uh, emulators right now for the x86 uh, PC where you can essentially run PS3, PlayStation uh, 2, PlayStation 1 games. So considering the specifications, or at least the uh, supposed specifications of the PlayStation 5, which is, once again, a Zen-based architecture uh, running uh, eight uh, cores, 16 threads, Navi-based GPU, blah, 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 blah. Very similar, in fact, to what Microsoft are doing for the next-generation Xbox, although obviously we don't know how the two stack up in terms of raw specs yet or customizations. It certainly is not out of the realms of possibility that just via software emulation alone, Sony could achieve backwards compatibility with the PlayStation uh, 3 and other systems. And obviously, the x86 nature of the PlayStation uh, 4 to uh, PlayStation 5 means that it should not be that big of a deal whatsoever to natively support the PlayStation 4 with the PS5. And for Sony to do this is a requirement because it's almost a certainty that Microsoft are going to continue to push backwards compatibility of the next generation Xbox, similar to what they have done with the uh, Xbox One systems. And I have to say that that combined with the marketing around the Xbox One X has allowed them to be a lot more successful over the past year or two. Obviously, Sony are still ahead 
but given what we know uh, of Microsoft's plans for the next generation systems, i.e. really just crank out as many first party and exclusive games as possible, <laughs> the next generation of systems is going to be a really fascinating one, particularly as cloud streaming is going to be such a thing. I covered recently that supposedly the Nintendo Switch as well is going to get certain games which are going to be streamable and it's also possible that Microsoft will also embrace streaming to the wider ecosystem. I would not be surprised for example uh, if you would be able to play Halo on let's say for the sake of argument your Android phone using the normal uh, methods you know as you would with game streaming. So Clearly Microsoft are here to play for the next generation and I don't think the console hardware is going anywhere. Sony of course really do have a vested interest in keeping people into the PlayStation ecosystem. So one of the best ways they can do that is naturally backwards compatibility. So supporting the ability to just plonk a disc into the console and you know have the system just play the game is almost a certainty. But that is assuming that the next generation consoles do even have a disc drive. And we don't know that. Let's just be honest. There is a possibility that either Sony or Microsoft would say, you know what, let's not have a Blu-ray drive. I don't necessarily think the launch consoles might do that. I would not be surprised though in, let's say, a couple of years when the inevitable cost-reduced variants of the consoles launch, let's say in 2022, they might release a model which does not have the Blu-ray drive. Uh, just simply to cut the cost and by then internet speeds will be even faster and I suspect just like well we all do that digital sales will have increased even further uh, so people probably wouldn't bat so much of an eyelid at that point. With all of that said hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff if you did like share comment and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.